And this varies tremendously depending on our level of activity and um, our level of activity and how hot or cold it is. But it can be up to three litres a day if it's hot and we're busy. It just depends. In the tropics, certainly you could lose three litres a day. Now, in addition to fluid being lost as frank sweat, that is sweat you can actually wipe off your forehead, all the time we're actually transpiring some water. So water's coming out of the skin and being evaporated all the time. It's called uh, insensible loss. So we're always losing fluid from our body surfaces anyway. Um, just transpiration via the skin. Maybe half a litre a day for that. Of course, we lose fluid in urine. Again, that depends on how much you drink. Maybe one and a half litres a day of urine produced. Ideally, though, a better figure would be maybe two litres to keep the urinary tract uh, cleared out. And some, some, um, some fluids lost in uh, faeces as well. Faeces aren't completely dry. Some fluid is lost. Not a lot, though. Maybe about... Uh, a tenth of a litre, something like that. So this is our water balance person, the way fluid is gained and the way fluid uh, is lost. It's very important to remember that these are only very rough guidelines and that it's going to vary depending on the situation the person is in. For example, a patient who is pyrexial will be losing a lot more fluid than a patient who is apyrexial, who has a normal body temperature. So if someone has a fever, one of our role as nurses is to make sure that they get plenty of fluids to stop that person from becoming dehydrated. Now what we'll do now is go on and look at the way that body fluids, body water is controlled. First of all, let's look at fluid or water regulation in the body. This is controlled by a hormone called ADH, or the antidiuretic hormone. It is released when water levels are low to increase tubular reabsorption of water from the nephron. Now let's think about this situation. When fluid is lost, the blood will become more osmotic. This is actually detected in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus produces this hormone called antidiuretic hormone. And the antidiuretic hormone is actually released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. That is from the neurohypophysis, the part of the pituitary gland which is made up of neurological tissue. Now the antidiuretic hormone is released when the blood is too osmotic and it works on the nephron in the kidney and it increases reabsorption of water from the nephron. Now the more water which is reabsorbed from the nephron, the less water will be left in the urine. The more water that is reabsorbed from the nephron, the greater the amount of water will be reabsorbed and maintained in the blood. Diuresis means a large production of urine or a large urine volume. So because the antidiuretic hormone increases tubular reabsorption, it reduces the urine volumes, therefore it has an antidiuretic effect. Now, when we drink a lot of water and the blood becomes, there's more fluid in the blood, that means the blood becomes more dilute. Therefore, the osmotic pressure of the blood drops. So when we're thirsty, the osmotic pressure of the blood increases because it's thicker. When we drink a lot, the osmotic pressure of the blood is reduced because the blood is more watery. Now, when that, ha when that happens, the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland will be reduced. So there's less antidiuretic hormone in the bloodstream. If there's less antidiuretic hormone in the bloodstream, there is less antidiuretic effect 
because there is less reabsorption of fluid from the nephron back into the blood. If there's less reabsorption of fluid from the nephron back into the blood, that means more fluid is left in the nephron, therefore more fluid passes into the collecting duct, therefore there are larger volumes of urine produced, therefore there is a greater diuretic effect. Now, the situation is similar with electrolyte regulation, and the electrolyte I'm going to look at at the moment is sodium, which is Na with a positive charge. Now, aldosterone is released when the serum sodium is low. So when the amount of sodium in the blood drops, aldosterone will be released from the adrenal gland, and that will increase tubular reabsorption of sodium. So the more aldosterone in the circulation, the more sodium will be reabsorbed. The less aldosterone in the circulation, the less sodium will be reabsorbed. So aldosterone increases the reabsorption of sodium. If it increases the reabsorption of sodium, that means it reduces the excretion of sodium. So aldosterone controls the amount of sodium in the blood in a similar way that antidiuretic hormone controls the amount of water in the blood. So in the normal situations, fluid balance is fairly easy to maintain. When we're thirsty, well, when our fluid levels are low, we feel thirsty, so we drink. So thirst is, is something that increases fluid levels because we drink. Actually, fluid levels have to drop a fair bit before we start feeling thirsty, so um, it's often good to drink before we feel thirsty, but nevertheless, thirst will control uh, the amount of water in the body by increasing it. And of course, the other main thing that controls the amount of water in the body, as we've discussed, is the concentration of the urine. When we want to conserve water, the urine will be more concentrated and will pass smaller volumes. When we want to get, get rid of, when we want to excrete more water, the urine will be more dilute and we'll have larger urine volumes. And there's one interesting thing here just before we're going to look at the abnormal situation, and that is the concept of the obligatory urine volume. Now, we've got so much waste to excrete per day waste products of metabolism, urea for example, need to be excreted. And the smallest volume of urine that that can be facilitated via, the smallest vehicle of water that can excrete the amount of waste product we produce in a day is 400 mils. So if someone's producing four or 500 mils of urine per day, very concentrated urine, that's probably enough to get rid of all the waste products that they're generating less than 400 mils a day and they're not excreting all of the waste products and they're probably accumulating them and they will become toxic. But now let's go and look at the abnormal situation. <clears throat> we're going to look at abnormal, or abnormalities of fluid and electrolyte balance. But first of all, we're going to look at the water, fluid balance first of all. And we'll start off by looking at what happens if there's too much water in the body. Now, this can happen uh, if we drink too much. We'd have to drink an awful lot too much, but some people drink and drink and drink lots and lots. This happens in, in mental illnesses such as schizophrenia, for example, where the patient just drinks huge amounts of water. There's a name for it. It's called polydipsia. And the patient gets uh, too much water in the system and water intoxication. The brain doesn't quite work properly. And um, because there's too much water in the blood, it means the osmotic pressure of the blood will be lower, um, so water will tend to diffuse into the red cells. So the red cells tend to get blown up. But as well as that, when there's too much fluid in the body, it dilutes the electrolytes. So effectively, the amount of electrolytes, the percentage of electrolytes in the blood, will also drop, giving rise to problems associated with electrolyte imbalance, which we'll look at later on. So too much water just from drinking is a possibility, but fairly uncommon. Most of us don't need to worry about that. If we drink plenty of water, it's actually quite a good idea. Water intoxication is really a pathological